Tight Kitty, which is what you spent the money for. The lights. I don't think I am. Yes, you are. I am. Okay, there I am. I can hear me now. Whew, man, those lights are weird. Okay. So, hello, everybody. I'm uh, not up there. I'm George Crump, uh, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Uh, we are an analyst firm focused on, uh, you guessed it, the storage industry. Um, and this is going to be a very, hopefully, very interactive panel. Uh, you're not allowed to ask questions yet. Just hang on. You'll get your turn. Uh, we're, we're from California. We share our feelings. Okay, yes. So um, I don't know if I'll be able to keep these guys contained much longer, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, so what I've asked them to do is give an extremely short uh, summary of their company. Less than five minutes would be preferred. Uh, if you've ever seen me moderate before, I will throw things at them if they go too long. And I am armed with ten bottles of water. Sean, over to you. All right. So I'm the guinea pig. Uh, my name is Sean Walsh. Uh, I work at Emulex. I run the uh, marketing group there. And uh, Emulex, as many of you may know, started out in the fiber channel business. Uh, over the last four years, we've expanded to 10 gig Ethernet and doing a lot of work uh, in virtual markets in terms of virtual NICs, uh, V switches, that sort of thing as we go forward, and continuing to kind of move up the Ethernet food chain. And uh, I guess I'm supposed to sound intelligent for the rest of this presentation. With that, I will give it to John. Is this working? Yep, you're on. Okay. Uh, my name's John Mates. I'm the CEO of uh, Bridge Store, and Bridge Store is a. Uh, now I'm on. There you go. Uh, Bridge Store has uh, been selling uh, deduplication storage for DPM for the last year and a half. Microsoft Data Protection Manager. Uh, we're just in the process of introducing uh, a new product that is more or less a, a, a new type of virtual tape library for that space. We also uh, have our own deduping file system called DDFS that runs on Linux. And uh, it does native deduplication inside Linux with the data then being able to be processed to cloud storage such as Amazon or other types of environments. Jerome. Hi, everybody. I'm Jerome Lecat, native Californian, as you can hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, not quite, but I do live in San Francisco. Uh, I'm uh, the CEO of Skelety. Skelety does very large-scale storage. We're actually a software company. And what we do is uh, our customers will buy a bunch of x86 servers with some disk in them, put our software, and they get a large-scale storage platform that's completely scale-out. Okay. So I'll, I'll start. This is supposed to be the hot storage technology uh, group here. So uh, let's go in reverse order. Uh, Jerome, what makes you guys hot? Uh, scale out. Okay. That, that's really the way to go. Uh, when basically storage is getting concentrated by a way of the cloud, by people wanting to access data through their mobile, so it doesn't make any sense to put the data in a specific data center when it's going to be accessed through the network anyway. Mm -hmm. So as storage gets concentrated, you want to have a scale out architecture which gives you a simpler architecture to manage, better reliability, and a lower cost. Okay. John, what makes you guys hot? Well, again, like I had mentioned earlier, we, uh, we have our own deduplication file system called uh, DDFS that uh, basically will separate metadata from physical data so that you can actually send the physical data up to something like an Amazon or other providers and keep the metadata locally. And so basically without the two combined, you can't get your data back. So it's like a treasure map, one half and the other half. And without the two, you can't get your data back. And then combining that in a number of different marketplaces between backup and uh, NAS gateways or NAS to object stores. Okay. Sean. Uh, so for Emulix right now, the, the big thing is being able to connect the cloud seamlessly. So we put a lot of work recently into uh, some technologies called overlay network. So VMware has a version they call uh, VXLAN. Microsoft has NVGRE. And what we're really trying to do is add what we call software-defined convergence to the pipe so that you can, from any direction, pick your protocol, pick your destination and location, and you can completely VPN and vMotion uh, or transfer uh, in and out of the cloud and in and out of the private data center to drive scalability of connectivity. You know, aside from that, when you, when you talk about network connectivity, you know, it's, people expect it to be like a utility. But just like we saw I, uh, phones 
go from being simple communication devices into basically virtual platform or uh, uh, travel platforms, we're going to see the same thing happen with networking. And at each individual place where people expect unique and custom uh, connectivity, they'll be able to define that on the fly as they go. Okay. So um, each of you have mentioned the, or used the C word. The C uh, word. The C word, cloud. Um, so give me a feel in your, what you guys are saying. I mean, I, I, each of you kind of interact with that market differently. What are you seeing from an adoption standpoint? John, we'll go ahead and start with you this time. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting because I just was in Simon Robinson's uh, presentation about the adoption of the cloud. And uh, he, he's pretty right. He said it's like 8%. And I think that's probably high. Um, my view, when I talk cloud, I'm also meaning uh, basically internal cloud. And my, my view is that basically that's where the cloud's going to go first. You know, not many people are going to go out to Amazon and stuff, even though my stuff will work with it. But, you know, primarily, uh, you know, it's going to be internal. People are going to go out. And I know in Southern California, the, they've got all these data centers all over the place. You can go rent space, and you can put... You know, your own, you know, uh, computers in this space. They'll give you power. They'll give you Internet. They'll give you everything. You can put all your own infrastructure in there. Uh, so why not do that you know, where you're close to the pipes and you can move it anywhere you want? Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and I think you're going to see a lot of corporations doing that. Okay. John? You know, to me, cloud is a lot like my granddaughter. Um, she's... So wait, you're old enough to have a granddaughter? Yes. What's up with that? Wow. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, when you have the first one at 17, you know, okay. you, yeah. you, you get the, the laws of... Got it. That clears All right. It moving up. on quickly now. Yeah, I'm not such a <laughs> yeah. uh, But, you know, she's six years old. She can go to her Mac. She can start Skype. She can find a, each of her grandparents and call us and does on a regular basis without any respect for time zones. Um, but to me, that's kind of what you're seeing happen with IT data centers, is you got a new generation of people who are coming in, and they're used to that paradigm. And I think cloud is going to be a fairly ubiquitous technology. It's going to be driven by the end user in. I think it's very much how we saw social media uh, become used. And you know, it's going to sort of creep in, and it'll become part of the culture. Uh, but the concept that we're going to have this mass exodus from the data center to the cloud, uh, I don't think is realistic. And there are still huge bandwidth issues that have to be solved uh, on the telco side to make that happen. Jerome, do you disagree? No, I actually agree with both of them. Oh, okay. uh, if, if, you, if you talk, uh, if cloud for you is just an infrastructure as a service like Amazon and being used by enterprise, what I notice is uh, all of the vendors out there, including us, by the way, um, we always have the same three or four use cases. And, and, and you go to conference after conference, and vendors talk about always the same use cases. Um, that, that's not showing real traction. If you talk about cloud as a new type of IT architecture, and if you talk about cloud as software as a service or social networking or a new way of doing IT, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And that's where we make money, actually. Okay, great. Uh, anybody have any questions in the audience? Oh, God, oh, Greg stood up. <laughs> Greg, you got anything? Not at the moment. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll continue on then. Um, so from a, a market standpoint, I mean, we've got Emulex that's essentially very well established comparatively to the two gentlemen to your right. Right. Thank you. Sorry, I failed that yeah, too. If I had hair, it would be great. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I know that feeling. And, so, and you guys are sort of in that not so much startup mode anymore. Where, where would you say you are from a progression of company, and what are your big challenges going forward? The VCs call us transition phase. <laughs> well, define what that is. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> does that mean there's two doors? <laughs> and you get to pick Seriously, which one you want? Seriously, I was told that I'm in transition phase, okay? You, but you don't know what you're transitioning to? No, I mean, what, I think that what they mean is uh, um, there, there's a startup phase where the product's not really proven, the market's not really proven, it's not sure that this kind of technology will take a real market. Mm -hmm. And then there's the growth phase where, you know, you're in the $50 million thing and you're already an established company. And we're somewhere in the middle. So the product works, we have a market, and we're not yet at the $50 million mark. 
What, what's the big inhibitor for your, in your view of, of people getting your technology and deploying it? The, the people who need our kind of technology, um, they're basically big consumers of storage. They typically have a petabyte or more, and, and we're even more comfortable if they have more than 10 petabytes. These people right now, they're wondering whether they're better off building their own technology, even though they know that it, they will have to hire 20 people and maintain it over time, or buying a technology like us as a software license. Okay. And that decision, uh, this make or buy decision, typically takes between a half a year to a year, and there are some jobs involved in this. That, that, that's what's slowing the growth. Okay. Um, John, where are you, and, and what's your inhibitor to further growth? Well, we've been shipping in the market, uh, again, the DPM, the Data, Protect, Data Protection Manager market, uh, for over a year now with our, our version one uh, deduplication technology, and we're just in the process of releasing our generation two and the, the new uh, business model that follows with that. So we're kind of in transition, but a different kind of transition than what you're talking about. Uh, so we're going from uh, uh, generation one to generation two, and we're introducing all that in the next uh, month or so and releasing it. So it's a little different scenario in between. Sean? Yeah, for us, it's, it's, it's a little different. Um, have you guys ever heard the riddle of the Sphinx? What walks with, you know, four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and, or, and three in the evening? Yeah, I'm towards the end of the one. You're at the end of that one? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and really, that's kind of where we're at, because, you know, the, the answer to this is man. You crawl as a baby, you walk as a man, and you use a cane when you get to become an old man. And, you know, that's kind of how our business is. We have, we have a couple of product lines that are elderly, and, you know, we're trying to send them off to the, to the old folks' home and let them go away. We've got a couple of stable product lines like Fiber Channel that, you know, you know here's a surprise. We went from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. And guess what? We're going to do 32 next. You know, not really a lot of surprise there. Um, but it's the 10 gig market where we're trying to spawn things differently because our market's changing. Okay? If you look at what we do, we connect stuff to servers. And where the servers are being built, how they're being deployed, and what they're being deployed for has changed more in the last five years than it has in the previous 20. Why? The C word. Okay. It's cloud. Yeah, cloud for those yeah. of you who, yeah. But, but I, don't fill in the blank on that. I'm a professional. Don't try this at home. Go That's ahead. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at where servers are transitioning and the types of servers, um, that's really the, the challenge for us as a company is to get you know, take a thousand people and let them get out of their rut and move on to something new. That's the biggest challenge in the company. And you got to find new customers. If you keep going after the existing ones that you have today, the whole new universe that's evolving, you're going to miss. And that's really our biggest challenge as a company. Okay. Uh, from, from your guys' perspective, what's, how many of you guys are likely to uh, engage with an emerging vendor? Say somebody that's been in business for... Who's the youngest? Three years. Who's three, years. Uh, three years or less. You will? So one out of 50. That could be a problem. Um, what, what makes it okay for you to engage? What, why are you comfortable engaging with a, a younger com uh, company? Or are you just kind of a risk taker? Well, it's um, interesting. Okay. Um, Learn how things work, um, learn new things, see how the market reacts on this stuff. Okay. That's why I'm there. Okay, good. Uh, is there sometimes where you they're solving a problem that your legacy vendors don't can't or don't? Um, yeah, we are specializing on uh, email. Okay. So we do um, big scale email processing. Let's say it this way. And and so the legacy guys do that. Well, maybe they can, but um, we do it better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. Um, That's fair. Go may, may I ask the room, how many of you actually manage uh, some storage systems? Okay. Cool. Keep your hands up. <laughs> oh, keep your hands up. I, I did. Uh, good. How many of you manage oh, a storage system that. today that's larger than, let's say, one petabyte? Three out of ten, so thirty percent. Thank you. All right, no lead gen in the middle of the presentation. Yeah. Oh, you bet. I'm noticing every one of them. 
<laughs> I thought we were going to do our best village people next. Wow. We need to rescan those last three guys. So. Um, <laughs> so, let me ask you guys, what do you, what do you think that are the hottest technologies out there? This is storage. That's why they call it Snorage. There isn't any. Go ahead. Simplicity. I'm sorry? Simplicity. 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 I do not. Simplicity. As in the concept of simplicity or the, the product? No, simplicity. The start part of simplicity. Yeah, that's right. So the com company name is Simply Viti, not Simply ah. City, Simply Viti. Ah. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? What's their, what's their product? Uh, they do converge system for uh, uh, now, nowadays just for VMware. But this is data center in the box with dedupe and all those features you spoke here about. They're like a Nutanix almost. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a startup of Doron Campbell, which was an uh, entrepreneur in Diligent. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, are you a customer of them? <laughs> Do you work for them? Oh, okay. Just checking. <laughs> From a technology standpoint, if you guys look at your, am I still on? Oh, he keeps yeah, turning. You're on. on. That's you're clever. On. We can hear you. Okay, it's weird. Um, from a technology standpoint, if you guys kind of look at what you're planning next year, uh, I'll just do a multiple choice. I'll say um, uh, order of importance, um, storage performance, um, reducing storage costs, or uh, improving uh, data protection. Which are most important? So. Um, I forgot what the first one was, and I know I just said it. Performance, storage, cost performance. And yes, yeah, performance. Who, who's mostly concerned about performance? Okay. Who's uh, more concerned about reducing cost? Fuel on cost, and then who's concerned about mostly data protection? Data protection. Okay. And those that didn't vote. You didn't vote because... You I have no know. concerns. Everything's running yeah. perfect. Yeah. What did I miss? <laughs> so if, if it's not one of those three, what did I Just yell it out. What did I miss? All of them. All of them. Uh, yeah, okay. All of the above. Anything? But am I missing anything other than those three? Analytics. What else? That it? So let's talk about those. What about performance? What are you guys doing in the performance aspect, Jerome? We're a scale-out system. You just add machines, and we deliver more performance. Whether it's IOPS or bandwidth, we'll, we'll just deliver as much as you need. Now, I'd like to challenge the person who said that it's always about performance. Um, Amazon S3 doesn't deliver performance, doesn't try to deliver performance, and there are a ton of people who are very happy with Amazon S3. And we're actually seeing, we did a lot of uh, performance improvement over the past 12 months, and... Um, I will challenge. I think that when, once you deliver enough performance, especially in a scale-out model where you can always add more as the user base grows or as the application grows, then it's not about performance anymore. It's more about simplicity and cost. I, I see, I mean, the recurring theme I see at customer meetings has, has to be simple to manage and it has to be cost-effective. Once you've met the performance bar. Well, I always... I, yeah, so that's kind of where I was going because when people talk about performance, they really talk about performance or latency, you know, how long something takes to get to a drive. So if, if you're talking about raw performance, there's some applications that require that. Uh, it's just as important. There's a lot of applications that require low latency. So uh, the real issue is which one of those do you mean by performance? I don't, I'm not trying to walk away from it. But from, from our standpoint, our, our particular product has to worry about performance at an upper end because it's doing backup technology. But yet when you work on NAS gateways and things like that, uh, you've got slow wires in the way. So, you know, performance is less of an issue there. So it, it really all depends. I, w I would say that Store Simple didn't quite fail. Well, if you qualify for the success, then it's good. <laughs> do, you do you have any 
about any, that. Do you have any information that it was a fire sale? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> well, because you're the neutral analyst. I, 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 my, my understanding was okay. It wasn't great, but it was, I don't know if I'd call it a fire sale. But I don't, I don't have the actual number. Microsoft, you know, doesn't call me up very often and run it by me, so. They should. And the they VCs didn't ask your opinion before uh, buying? They, I said they should, but they don't, so. But the VCs aren't gonna tell you. No. Uh. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the market I think is gonna be even more successful. I mean, it, you got NAS going up to cloud, but also, you know, all these object stores that are people are building, they're gonna need NAS gateways to talk to object stores. Well, I, I think to Jerome's point, look at the success of uh, Amazon Glacier, right? I mean, here we're actually selling the fact that it's really, really, really slow storage. Slow. And, yeah. <laughs> that's, and, a, that's an understatement. And, and, it's, it's, yeah. well, and, and they named it. It's not like you could say, well, you know, like I, I lived in this neighborhood once in, in Texas. It was uh, Thousand Lakes uh, something. I, there are, first of all, in Texas, there aren't a thousand lakes total in the whole state, I think. And so there certainly wasn't a thousand lakes in the subdivision. But, but they can't be accused of kind of having a false name. They called it Glacier, right? So, right, right. In all sense of the word. So I think that, you know, it, to Jerome's point, it just depends. Sean, I know you guys are doing a lot with performance. What's, what's up with that? Yeah, for us, the, the challenge with performance is not how fast it can go, but how well it can be distributed. So the, the things that we're focused on are as you get into virtual environments and there's 10, 20, 30 VMs per server, how do you take the bandwidth that's available, divide it up, allocate it, prioritize it, and do that as a policy that can roll over through the data center? So for us, it's much more about that. Uh, we have a new tool that uh, we've been shipping for a couple years now uh, called One Command Vision. And the whole point of it is just to show you where your gaps are, where, where, you're hit, where you're getting stopped on. Is it at the switch? Is it at the spindle? Is it at the RAID controller? And there's about 25 steps in that, in that food chain. So when we talk about performance, um, that goes back to the point of what John was making, is that it's also about latency is how do you get the roadblocks out of the way in terms of what you're doing? So from a technology perspective, you know, if you look at uh, the next-gen cards that we're working on for 16 gig and 40 gig, we don't expect anyone to run them at that speeds. The question is how do you take that and distribute that bandwidth into usable uh, individual streams? So I think that kind of gets into the whole software-defined networking yep. thing. Uh, how many, are you guys have heard the term software-defined networking? Well, before I ask, I will go to the audience. No, I, I, I have, a, I have an, another question concerning database technologies, uh, uh, especially uh, in, a, in a storage environment. Um, the, 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 the actual new hype concerning in-memory databases, uh, Zapana, for example, what do you think uh, will this change uh, storage uh, systems in the future? Or is it just a hype? Uh, too expensive that it will become uh, implemented in, in... Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, if there's one thing I've learned about watching Fusion IO's ASP is that you know, people will pay for performance. Um, you know, it, it, it's like anything else. It is a segment. I don't think it's hype. Um, if, if you look at SSD flash today, there's even tiers within SSD of pure DRAM, you know, and I forget, is it N flash, M flash, Q flash, whatever the hell it is. But, you know, there, there's three or four flavors of that depending upon the quality of service you want, what type of write performance you need, what type of write consistency you need. And if you look at what's happening with the scalability of the Internet and things like social media, when you type on Facebook, you expect instant response. And if they want to increase their revenue per server in memory databases, one of the ways I expect to see those things happen. So I think it's going to be a bit niched, but I don't think it's overhyped. Any other questions? So let me ask you guys a question on uh, how much are you hearing the term software-defined networking and or software-defined storage? Is that a term you're starting to see float around? Mm -hmm. Does it sound like a bunch of um, hype, hype to you guys? I just wish I worked for NICERA a few months ago. <laughs> So let's talk about the software-defined insert, whatever you want to have, networking, storage, whatever. Uh, is it real? And or, or are we you know, doing another cloud hijack term here? So I look at it as two things. I think what you're going to see is 
an incremental layer of flexibility added. Um, when uh, we look at our cards today, okay, the way that they're designed, you can, you can modify the firmware and pick what you want to run on it. You can then add different drivers, some that do kernel bypass so you have lower latency, some that do UDP for video broadcasting, and then we have uh, an application layer on top of it where you can do things that uh, help accelerate specific applications and standards. So I think you're going to see people take the concept of software defined and say, we're going to add an incremental layer around us, okay? You're going to see Cisco and Juniper and all these other guys go, okay, we're going to add an open shell around us that's kind of a shim to what we already have, and we're going to call ourselves open. And I think that that'll kind of be the beginning of the end, uh, because there are too many people out there. This is kind of like the Linux paradigm model. And it's too open. It's too easy for them to buy uh, commodity switching and add value this way. And I think if you don't embrace that type of flexibility and openness, you know, not going to kill you right away, but it will get you eventually. Okay. Uh, from the software-defined storage standpoint, is that a st st stealing of storage virtualization, or do you think it's a real term? So let's look at it. We're a pure software technology. We transform a bunch of servers into a storage platform. I think that's software-defined storage. Okay. Yeah. I, I but we've been doing this for four years, way before the term was around. So I don't know if we should change the name of the company <laughs> or if there's something new. We're going to uh, get you that Marie Osmond t-shirt, I was country before country was cool. <laughs> I take it a step further in that... Um, the, the, the product that we have, our Gen 2 product coming out, is going to be a software-as-a-service model. Uh, it is going to be distributed strictly in a VM. So my deal is I'm 100% software, and you turn it on. If you like it, you use it, and if you don't like it, you turn it off, and you don't pay me anymore. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get any more software than that. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Uh, any questions? Oh, by the way, that does bring up uh, uh, something where I think you're going to see a lot more is, is uh, virtualization actually inside the storage arrays. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no reason that you can't do it. I think and you're going to see the storage arrays not disappear, but be less meaningful over time. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. going to be getting more stupid, but you're going to be able to add more intelligence because it's too hard to move the data around the networks anymore, so why not move the applications to where the data is? I totally agree with that. Yeah. Hang on, we got, we got a guy with a mic in the back. So I, I don't know I'm if... I'm loving the queue, so hang on. Go in the I back. I don't know if it's a question, but a comment, because if you speak about software-defined storage or software-defined network, so it may be uh, somebody can think that you don't need any hardware, but I think you need a lot of hardware, and uh, if you do something only with software, then you don't utilize the all features which hardware can offer you. So I think uh, uh, I don't trust so much... To, to have uh, software-only solutions, you can see VMware. They can do snapshot. Well, that's, that's, that's the next step, by the way. We're going to go from software Sorry. defined to telecom. So uh, no one can use the uh, snapshot from VMware for real production. So VMware has a lot of features which have they implemented by software, but it's, it is useless. So and I think uh, VMware is quite a cute some company. So there are a real limit. What you can do with software, what you cannot do software, and I think for real, simply, uh, or and converge technology, you need to combine both together. Okay. So you're referring to the performance drop that you take as you start to add more and more VMware-based snapshots, right? Yeah, of course. And there are many so, other features. But if we, as, as the processors and everything become increasing more, because really what, I, what we've identified as the challenge with um, degraded performance in VMware snapshots is if VMware does a horrible job with essentially write traffic in general and then specifically dynamic writes because a, a snapshot, if you look at kind of the, the I.O. chain, is a, it's a pretty, you know, per byte, it's a pretty heavy load, right? So, it, but if you put that in, in for example, a, a flash environment, all that performance problem goes away, right? So as an example, one of the things you could do is uh, create a logging architecture similar to what we already do today in databases where writes go to uh, either DRAM or NVRAM or even Flash first and then you push it just like you do in a database. You just uh, channel it down. So I think that I think smart people will figure out ways to get around that. I agree with you 100% that there's a performance problem today, but I think that eventually 
that you'll see um, the, the hardware will, either the hardware will just outstrip it. You know, I, you know, what I always say, I'm a Mac guy, Macintosh guy, by the way, but I always say eventually if you get a big enough, fast enough machine, Windows isn't an absolute piece of junk, right? So, um, <laughs> and so good processors can make up for really bad software implementation, right? And I'm not saying necessarily that the snapshot implementation is bad in VMware. It's just it's challenged when it comes to writes. But there are ways around it, and I think that you'll see more and more of that as well. So you're saying Intel has held back Microsoft's success. Or kept them alive. <laughs> or kept them alive, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but the, um, so, but take off on that. I mean, it is, because is, you guys were talking also about a, a subject that I'm interested in, is almost the ultimate in convergence of just putting everything on one flip, and actually the uh, simplicity is kind of the same thing, right? Um, how, I mean, why aren't you guys doing that today, Jerome? Well, essentially because we started as a storage company and we, we, there is so much that we can do in such a big market on storage that we just grow from our market. Um, you know, we started three years ago as an object store and the first thing that became apparent to us is that why are we for, forcing everyone to rewrite their application when all they want is a scale-out storage that they can talk to? So the first thing that we've done and where we've put R&D is to manage all the scalability but be able to address this as a file system. So rather than need a gateway, be us native scale out and file system. And that's taken some work. But um, being able to run processes on the data that we've stored is totally part of our roadmap and makes sense. Okay. And, and you had a question, sorry. It's a question for the panel, basically. You talked about software-defined network, and you talked about software-defined storage. Mm -hmm. Do you think in the future we, we will see just not the NAS-based integration into the cloud, but also with those improvements, a, a SAN or block-based approach yes. to the cloud? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And why do you think so? I mean, that's just... Uh, you said yes first. <laughs> <laughs> because at large scale, it's just much more cost effective and much easier to manage. The problem with the SAN is when you need five petabyte of SAN, there's not one system today that you can buy that gives you five petabyte of SAN. So you need to stage several systems, and then you need a management system overall, and then you probably also need a tiering system to move the data from one thing to the other. So you end up with something that's very complex to manage. And by the way, after five years, what do you do? You buy a new system that you stage, and you migrate all the data, and you rewire all your applications. Okay? It's just not practical at that scale. It worked very well for 100 terabyte. It doesn't work for 5 petabyte. If you have a scale architecture that provides you with different class of storage, very, very fast, fast, very slow, like Glacier, and you have several interfaces to come into that core storage, you're much more nimble. You can grow the interface if you want more performance. You can grow the storage on every tier that you need, and you just have one system. And I think that the, the companies that are very successful as a cloud service, um, you know, Amazon as an in, uh, infrastructure as a service, but also the cloud services, have developed an infrastructure that looks like this in a way or another. Okay. So uh, was your, uh, one question, uh, help me clarify, was your question, are we going to have cloud-based SANs or block-based cloud storage? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think you will. I mean, uh, iSCSI is a perfect setup to set some of those cloud-based environments up. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of the iSCSI authors, so there, there's a lot of hooks that you can put in there that uh, could extend the iSCSI for cloud without breaking it. And um, I don't see any reason why somebody, you know, wouldn't take advantage of that and, and deal with it. So the only issue with block-based storage over long distances is how do you do a check disk <laughs> over the wire. So th there's going to have to be some kind of intelligence there to, to be able to do some of those offload utilities uh, on the other side. Yeah, I think it's going to be a hybrid solution. I, I think to some of the points that, that John's talking about in terms of the metadata and other pieces, um, there will be some form of, of separation of that. Uh, I think some of the things that OpenStack uh, is proposing is, is inching that way. And it, I know, it's inching, it's not leaps and bounds. Um, and, and I think the other, the other part that, you know, again, when you talk about the cloud, you also got to deal with the bandwidth issue from whatever your source device is uh, to wherever your target device is. Yeah. And 
you know, despite all the, the goodness that we've, we've experienced so far um, in the improvements, it's still a long way to go from hardwired or local wireless uh, transport. So until that gets fixed, I think that's the biggest impediment to you know, true cloud-based, anywhere, anytime uh, storage access. But on the other side of the coin, though, you know, the last mile is always going to be an issue. Yeah. Right? right? So, but once you're in the cloud and you want to go between destinations... Then you're fine. You're fine. You should be able to do block storage all you want up there. So uh, somebody else? Way, there's a startup, ZRA Storage, that does exactly that today. Yeah, the yeah, iSCSI. There was somebody else back there. Wish him well. Somebody? I, I thought I saw him. So uh, while we're waiting for Greg to tackle another person to ask a question, let's talk about uh, something that I like to talk about is uh, flash storage. Uh, what are you guys each doing as it relates to flash? Uh, I, can, I can start with that. I, what I'm looking at is <clears throat> there's a number of different flashes that are coming out, but really uh, as a flash cache for tiers, just like we were talking about earlier. But I think you're, you're going to see a new tier of storage coming out that's basically going to be RAM in your PCs. And basically, they're going to be capacitor-based uh, RAM sticks. And uh, you're not going to get any faster of a tier than that. I mean, it's just it's raw RAM. And if the power goes out, the capacitors kick in. And uh, we'll save it to uh, onboard flash. And when the power comes back on again, it swaps it from flash back into RAM. So uh, these sticks are probably going to be about four times more money than a current memory stick today. But if you look at the performance you're going to get on it, it's going to be a, a wonderful environment and as a storage tier where you can take that first drop and put it into that flash right away or that memory, it's not flash, memory, and deal with that and then take it from another tier later on as it ages. I think that's what we're going to start seeing. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, I think that flash is a little bit o overhyped in terms of uh, the all flash array. Um, I said earlier that we use any generic servers, so nothing precludes us from using flash in these servers and we do it all the time. Um, we, put, we typically put the metadata on Flash, and that accelerates the overall operation very much. Okay. And for us, it's about linking those memory pieces together. So the RDMA technology that uh, we're putting in place on So just for everybody, technology. spell out RDMA and what uh, it does? Remote direct memory access. So it's basically being able to take data from one user memory space and, dr and move it directly to the user memory space on another computer. And that's, that's how you're going to see these memory systems talk to each other going forward. Uh, it's part of what the SSD guys are asking us to do in terms of our cards, is give them an API that lets them go, I have a SSD card here and an SSD card here, and I want to copy from A to B, and they don't have to go up through stacks or anything else. They just do a direct hardwire uh, from one system to the next. So that's what they want to do with, with uh, vMotions. So all these guys that, ha that, are, that have these PCI Express cards that are creating islands of storage, they want to be able to link those things together and do that. And, you know, those are the types of things that will change it from a, a connection perspective. Not nearly as sexy as a, a capacitor uh, resistor memory, but, you know, that's what but, we do. But those are basically SSDs, too, so they yeah. would want to take advantage of your same system to get it. So to, yeah. for what's your take on, just to kind of start something, what is your take on the uh, QLogic integration of SSD on their network? Oh, I love there? that question. Good. All right. How, much, how long do we have? Um, Where's Greg? 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, so guys, I think there's, the, when, when you talk about any product that you put in the market, there, there have become natural segmentations of things. Um, you know, why do you have different types of interface cards? Why do you have different uh, types of storage? Because there are different needs of the application. And if there's one thing we've learned is every time people try and build a Swiss Army knife, they end up cutting themselves with one of the blades they don't know how to use. And when you look at bringing I.O. and caching together today on the types of platforms that they're looking at, well, there's three problems. One is, how do you maintain coherency across physical servers without a unified database to do that? That's what these guys are solving, okay? But you're not going to do that on an HBA, all right? I, I love my cards, but I do know some limits, okay? So you've got to have that federated file system capability on top of that. You're not going to see that. The second is power. Um, you know, uh, at our sales meeting last year, we had the, uh, the IT director for the Bing Data Center, and he said, one watt is a million dollars a year. When you start talking about adding four or five watts per card, and then you, for dealing with the interconnect issues, 
and then you try and put a 50 watt card into a slot. It doesn't fit, takes up too much power. Uh, and what do you do when it fails? Now you've got your I.O. and your storage linked together. Instead of replacing a $500 HBA fruit, you've got to replace a $10,000 uh, storage fruit. And it, it just, the, the, the concept of distributing things and being able to have RDMA across stuff and that sort of stuff, I get the concept, but I think the implementation is really challenged in terms of how they, did, how they tried to do it. Uh, and for us, you know, we, we took a very different path. We said, we're going to go out and find the people that are doing this for a living, that are experts in it, that have spent a decade figuring out how to do cash coherency, and we're going to partner with them and say, what's the high-speed, low-latency pipe you need between these points, and what do we have to feed you so that you can keep track of this? And we've gotten a lot of resonance uh, with those leaders in the market based on that. Okay. So, uh, so I'll just keep asking a competitive question. Okay. So, uh, well, not you're done now. Oh, you're, done. Yeah, you're, you're done. Damn. You're done. Yeah, sorry. So, I, I mean, obviously, you know, Jerome, I'll, I'll go to you next. We've got a lot of uh, object guys in the market. I see two basic problems with object storage. Most of these people go, what? When you tell me that you are an object storage system, right? And uh, the second is there's a lot of guys that have sort of this scale out, use generic server model. What makes you guys different in that category? Okay, I'm not an object storage system. I'm a scale out, large scale storage system. <laughs> I'm done with the term objects. <laughs> okay. For exactly the reason you mentioned. Uh, okay. You object to objects? <laughs> yeah, no one wants to use objects. Okay. Um, so that was question one. <laughs> question two is, okay, so what makes us different? Than the other guys that are doing scale out uh, storage on generic hardware. Yeah, okay. Well, there's not that many of them. I mean, really, if, you, if, if we agree that objects are a different category, mm -hmm. then there's no one else. On generic hardware. Well, that was kind of tricky. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do for a living. It, it doesn't sound like... <laughs> You should be I was getting ready to drink water. I figured I had at least five minutes here. So like seri ser be. Seriously, uh, what I mean by that is, I mean, there's a ton of players that do scale-out object. We agree with that. I mean, there's about 12 of them that I can count. Okay. Uh, again, right now, object is really a tiny market. What's a market is being able to do scale-out applications and to be able to talk what application talks. So typically, file systems. If you look at the scale-out technologies that can be natively a file system, there's basically really living out there. There's Isolon and us. Okay. And Isolon's not on Is the hardware. Is that the hook? Oh, yeah, just a power thing. Um, and John, you know, in your market, obviously, everybody's got a data protection application at some level. Sure. And, you know, they're, they're probably, I, I would assume they go to you because they're frustrated with what they have. What are you, what are you seeing as your kind of... Uh, well, we, we kind of play in, in one spot particularly, which is that Microsoft data protection market. And uh, in general, I don't know, I'd like to see this. How many people are really excited about their backup software? I mean, <laughs> I don't know anybody that really likes their backup software. They have to have it. But one, one thing that I've, I've seen is that there is a, a migration uh, from uh, traditional backup vendors to Microsoft EPM. And uh, primarily because it's pretty much free. Uh, and because everybody has an enterprise license or whatever, they get it for, for practically nothing. The problem Microsoft EPM has is that the, the back-end data storage require, requirements are just enormous. And uh, so, uh, you know, being able to have a deduping system that can uh, replace that is, is really a, a powerful piece for us. The, the other aspect is traditional backup software up to this point does a rotten job with how to deal with off-site tapes. And I think that that's a, a new business that we can get into to where uh, we can dedupe the data and then send them off to the cloud. You don't need Iron Mountain anymore, and you can still maintain copies of, of your data. So we're not really going to compete with the backup guys. Use your backup guys for your snapshots and everything, but what we're going to come in and play is you know, when you want to get that data off-site, either on tape or in the cloud, we're going to be that, that piece. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, one question. You actually liked your backup software. Who do you have? Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. 
That's good. You should love what you do for a living. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I was going to say, do you work for a vendor? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, hold a second, then. I'm not real sure which backup software you're using, then. Okay. All right. So you love all of them equally? Sounds like it. He's not going to comment. I we love all our children equally. Yes, I, I, think he's, I think he's afraid to comment. I understand. <laughs> kind of like being married. Um, <laughs> whoops. Uh, so any other questions, comments from the group? Yes, sir. Because, uh, for example, if you uh, need to create clone and you use deduplication, then the creation of the clone should be quite fast. Yeah, or yeah. V or, I agree. Or VDI, you know, and all those stuff. Yeah. So, so I think you have started discussion about the performance and uh, okay. and those guys. So I think the the deduplication can help significantly. So right. my question is, uh, do you have experience with deduplication on primary data? On primary data, yes. I'm a big advocate of that. And what, what's the ratio you can reach or you, you, you meet in real production? Oh, in real production, you're only seeing probably a 20 to 30 percent savings in, in, on, on your data with deduplication. It, it also depends whether you combine that with compression. Because I kind of I put the two together. Uh -huh. Uh, so, if, and I think in the future, most of your data arrays are going to have deduplication and compression in there just for that, that performance. But I'll tell you another area. You mentioned VDI. This gets really interesting when it comes to deduplication because if you think about your VMs, most of them are coming from a common seed. And as you clone them, guess what? All those sectors get cloned. So if you had a primary storage box that had native deduplication in it for VHDs and VMDKs, that could be a very interesting product, what I'm actually thinking of doing, uh, because especially for VDI, if you think of the VDI storms right now and you turn on all those workstations at one time, your disk drives are going crazy. But if they were all deduped, you know, then you're probably pulling out most of those sectors from cache and you're not going to see these kind of performance issues that you're going to see. So there's an area where that performance can come in with dedupe. So in, in primary storage, it's a use case driven. Exactly. Uh, you're not going to see it everywhere, but right. there's, there's places where it makes absolute sense. Okay. Great. Who's next? Who's got the next question? Okay. If you haven't asked a question, you must ask a question. That's the rule. It's like Fight Club. Yeah, exactly. Except you only have three minutes to get it done. Got, yeah, it's got to be a quick question. You got a question at the back of the room. There you go. See, I, 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 I Mr. NetApp. NetApp guy again. Uh -oh. And you can't ask, why does EMC suck? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually. Well, you can. <laughs> It actually ties into uh, uh, compression and deduplication. And where do you see technology trends helping to make, uh, or you know, do you do you see technology trending in a direction that's going to make really fast compressing block devices possible? Because yeah. primary storage dedupe works well when you have uh, have set fixed aligned blocks. Yeah, you're absolutely uh, but when, right. But when you start compressing those, then you end up with chunks that are of you know, variable different sizes. So you're back down to variable blocks. Right. Uh, so you have to dedupe. Uh, you know, if you look at a traditional dedupe algorithm, you're going to go do a SHA on your block data, and then you're going to go do a hash lookup. The biggest part of your, your dedupe performance is lost in the hash lookup. So you've got to keep the latency as low as possible with that. And most of the time, people are doing that with huge memory stacks. Uh, and, and that allows you to get the bits at least tracked down to see if there's a dedupe. The other aspect you mentioned is compression. I think everybody knows what compression does to a processor. It absolutely destroys it. But uh, there are third-party cards out there that do do compression uh, in line. Uh, there's also some uh, Intel technology coming out soon, I think. You'll see that we'll do compression in uh, cores. Uh, and we'll also do a lot of the hashing algorithms in cores. 
So once you start getting to that point where, where Intel actually has a lot of this stuff embedded in there, actually making software stacks to, to go off into those cores and do those things are going to really cut down the latency. But again, you know, if you're looking at a high-speed database, even though I do know some high-speed databases out there that have added compression just to save space because databases compress really well. They may not dedupe really well, but they compress really well. Uh, I, yeah, I still say that with this, these kind of a technology enhancements coming down the pipe, you're going to see compression and deduplication definitely in primary storage as just a given. Thanks. Okay. George, entertain the crowd for a minute. Good. Okay. That's awkward. That's right. Ask, ask them a question and... Yeah, but they're not asking answering questions. I'll just ask the question and answer it myself. Well, then, then tell the world uh, as, as you see it. Okay. All right. You guys, take the microphones off. Put them on the chair. So actually, I thought that whole uh, core thing that John was talking about was total, total garbage. Um, how'd you like that? Yeah. Well, because Sean, see, I was going to start a fight up there, and I had to cut him off because Sean makes a big deal that everything's got to be offloaded onto the network card. So I'm really confused now because John's telling me I don't have to. We're going to have to have, like, panel part two to kind of settle that problem with the, with the cores. And now i got cores and offloading cards. And no, that would be, that's, no. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to have a meet the storage vendors during the reception, and that's going to be uh, where? At the theater thing. No, we're in the theater. We're in. The, we are in the theater it, now. There's a vendor theater. There's oh. a vendor theater. Yeah, over there. Dur during the reception, uh, right. we're actually going. You know, you'll be able to have a, a cocktail in your hand, but you, you have the chance to actually meet some of these same guys and have a, a, an opportunity to talk to them if you have further questions in a nice casual environment. And it'll be it'll be right next to the uh, the reception that goes on uh, immediately after this. Right. And right. just so you guys know, I don't only moderate. We actually do provide real thought occasionally. So. If you go to storage-switzerland.com, we have new storage articles every day. Okay. So, so let's, let's thank our storage, uh, storage vendors. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll roll right into the tape side of the equation, okay. and, uh, and, and we'll move right on. So we just have them introduce themselves first? I think we start okay. fresh. Why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and go on down the line. Okay. My name is Simon Anderson. I'm the product manager for Timber Data um, for tape products, and I've worked in the tape industry for 19 years. And uh, my name is Simon Gittens. I'm the worldwide director of tape drive development for Hewlett Packard, and uh, I've worked in the tape industry for 28 years. Okay. Great. <laughs> so let's start with this. Uh, how many of you guys still have tape in the data center? There you go. Uh, I'd say more than half. <laughs> so, uh, you know, let's start with the, the big one. Uh, you know, tape is dead, right? And I think that what we're seeing now repeatedly, it's not dead. Um, and, and we've broken the market down into basically two types of people, people that are st really st never stopped using tape. And then, but, but we do have a generation of people that are kind of just getting into the industry that, you know, have never really experienced tape. So from a uh, where do I use tape, just at a, a very simple level, uh, where do we, uh, what's the best way to implement it? Is it archive only? Is it backup? Is it both? Well, first of all, the tape is dead argument has been, has been around for as long as I've been in the industry. Yeah. I, I, I joined HP all those years ago, and it was, it was prevalent then, and we're still here. So uh, obviously what's happening with tape is that the use case is changing. Um, it was clearly, obviously, a, a backup medium, uh, but um, in the past five years, really, that's really begun to shift um, uh, as, you know, backup is shifting to disk, but there are many attributes that tape has that means it's still relevant in a backup um, uh, use, but uh, it's these days it is shifting more to uh, the archive type uh, marketplace where you can utilize the, uh, the durability and the reliability and, the, and the, the, the long life retention of the data. So it's shifting. Okay. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, many people sort of use tape within their disaster recovery and they consider it as a last line of the prep. Um, last line of defense and their data protection strategy. But really, I think as the role of change, tape changes, what you'll actually see is tape being used more 
as it really is the only long-term strategy for managing data growth and managing storage costs. People just can't physically keep adding more disk. They need power and cooling. And physically, they're going to outgrow the size of the data center. So that's where Tate really has a very large part to play, not from within the, the strength the decision makers are going to invest in Tate because of what the cost financial savings to the organization are. He's not on. Mike Guy? He's not on. Oh, there you go. Hey, I'm, I'm really on, but go ahead. Can you hear me now? No, try, try yours. Okay, so what I was saying at Quantum, we see Slightly. tape really playing into the data protection space, but as well into the, ba the big data needs, okay? As you, from a data protection standpoint, uh, there is a lot of customers that use disk in combination of tape, okay, to do pure backup. And in the big data space where people have to manage huge amount of data, they are trying to find the right balance in terms of cost and, um, and service availability. And they're trying to mix between disk and tape to find the right balance and be able to store the data over the long term. So we, the role of tape is changing. It's no longer only for backup. His footprint into the backup space is shrinking but it's from bringing it to the long-term retention archive or big data, no matter how you want to call it, that is growing extremely fast. Okay. So, um, and the tape market is expanding right before your eyes because we had last-minute additions to the panel here. <laughs> um, I did that pretty well, don't you think? <laughs> uh, Molly and Peter, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Molly Rector. I'm with Spectrologic, and we're responsible for manufacturing the tape storage systems. Um, what else are we doing here, George? Uh, pitch. That's, that, that's good. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, we thought that the other session had not finished yet. There was a bit of confusion outside. It's all right. Yes. Okay, my name is Peter Fowler, and I'm uh, with Fujifilm in North America, responsible for the North and South American business. And, of course, Fujifilm is known as a, or the tape manufacturer. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. All right, so we were starting the discussion on, uh, you know, one of the things I get worried about with you guys and I'll just kind of lump you all into the same basket, is that we get a little too focused on archive and don't talk about the backup use case enough. And I think that, uh, and, and I don't know which one of you three had, did say it, but uh, tape still has a role in backup, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mean, one of the things, and, and it was actually the guy this morning that said it, um, one of the things I get worried about with, like, deduplication is if your, uh, if your deduplication index gets corrupted, you've just lost all your data, and, and you basically have to start all over again with backups, right? So talk to some of the areas where they could use uh, tape as, as also in the backup uh, market. I'll just, Peter, why don't you go first since you were the... You know, um, I spoke this afternoon earlier. I think it's tape up. Uh, backup is a, the typical form for tape usage, besides DR compliance and so on. But now tape is expanding, actually, their role out in an active archive, in a NAS storage. So I think it's, we're not looking at, you know, that tape is substituting the original role. I think it's expanding the role, as you just said. Mm -hmm. Okay. I definitely think you see tape in its traditional roles being very fixed as far as um, there may be disk city in front of it if it needs it to buffer speed and access times. But when tape, is, when a backup is going to be stored for seven years, typically it's still much more power efficient and cost effective than even on spinning disk deduplication to keep it there for the long term. Um, and then certainly for disaster recovery where you're sending tapes off-site to Iron Mountain facilities to a second location, the tape has continued to have a very fixed role. We were just in a meeting a few minutes ago across the street, and Iron Mountain was saying that they have more tapes in storage year over year than they have historically. That's continued to grow for that traditional disaster recovery. So the traditional markets have stayed similar. Sometimes there's disk in front of tape where there wasn't a decade ago. Um, sometimes there's not, just depending on what the customer's environments look like. Yeah. We did a survey uh, last week, and we, I was surprised that um, it was during a webinar, and 43% of the people said that um, their, prime, their initial target is still tape, right? The, the assumption, I think, is always that disk is. So let's, let's do this. Uh, if you're, and we promise not to come out and attack you. Well, I can't vouch for all of these folks, but I won't. Uh, how many people just don't buy it? 
that that tape is making a comeback or that how about how many people believe that tape is more reliable than disc okay you guys have all been to earlier presentations because normally it's not that high so your guys presentations are working that's pretty good so but there was about half of you guys that don't uh, believe it so what can we do to kind of convince them guys other than say I told you so you know, now first of all I would like to, to make one in general comment it's not this versus tape so we should never, you know, consider here that we are fighting against the disk industry with the tape. It's how to optimize your data center, how you have solution, you know, in your data center to optimize your data center. There's active archive solutions out, you know, help you clearly. I think you have to consider your data growing f between 50 and 70 percent. That is what the analysts at least say, correct? But your budget says the same or actually is declining. How do you manage your data center? So you need to optimize your data center. And there are solutions. And tape is a great solution. And tape actually now can be used in an active archive as a NAS storage. Any other comments on the reliability? So clearly, um, tape has attributes that um, fit into the, um, you know, the data center in ways that uh, Peter described in that uh, uh, you don't just have a, a storage that is all tape or a, or a, a system that is all disk. You know, you you uh, focus the, uh, the the data on the attributes that you are really care about. So you wouldn't use tape in an application where you need to get to the data in milliseconds, or you need random access. But you wouldn't use disk if you need to keep it for uh, a, a longer period of time. And of course, you've got, you've got the ultimate of um, of uh, data rec recovery in the event of in the event of uh, some sort of disaster. Uh, and clearly, uh, tape is very well suited for that sort of application. Okay. I think very much one of the other key things to note is over the last 10 years, there have been huge developments in within tape, and all the tape vendors are investing hundreds of millions of dollars each year within tape. Um, you're seeing increases in capacity, performance, new features and functionality, such as LTFS, which makes tape much easier to use. Customers can drag and drop files directly from their desktop onto, the onto tape, they can then search, they can play videos. I mean, LTFS has, has been used heavily, with, promoted within the media and entertainment market, but really I can see that becoming mainstream and becoming an industry standard for how people are going to move. Let me interrupt you for a second. How many people know, are familiar with the term LTFS? You guys are doing how many, of you, how many of you use LTFS in your data center? Uh, uh, good. good job. Okay. So one thing I want to add. Who intends to use LTFS? Exactly. <laughs> who, is, who intends to use LTFS besides these two? Yeah, you're allowed to. Uh, so, what's the people that? So, we had a lot of people raise their hand, and say they knew what it was. We had a few people say they were using it, and a few people said they're intending to. If you just yell out an answer, why won't you intend on using it? If I said that correctly, what's your what's your hesitation to using LTFS? Hey, give that man a, like, something, because he nailed it. That's the right answer right there. I've, I've got a, we've got a descending opinion from the floor, and I happen to know this man. I would not trust a thing he says. No. <laughs> Why is that not true? Thank you. Okay. But I would actually make a Well, I think he was talking specifically backup applications. Were you not, sir? Yeah. So, hang on one sec. Maybe I can jump in here. Um, there are backup applications which can write to tape in a true LTFS format, such that customers, one of the advantages of using LTFS is customers can drag and drop files. They can use tape much more easily. Okay. The other sort of key advantage is, should you want to recover files in 10 or 15 years' time, you don't need to use the backup software. You can simply just plug it into the operating system and search, browse for the files. Whereas backup software are applications which have the ability to go and do that, and then the data is simply written in a true LTFS format. The software or application is really just using it more for how customers are managing the workflow of data um, mm -hmm. within that environment. I'll tell you from our perspective, we are briefing... Well, every time we're briefed by a backup software vendor that's in that class that you're probably thinking of, our number one question is, do you support LTFS? And most of them give a very 
correct answer, but loosely translated, it means why would we do that? Because then we'd lose the customers. Only probably, probably uh, HPSS that supports uh, LTFS. Actually, probably. HPSS does not support LTFS. Okay. Uh, but your so point is correct. That yeah, the, the point, it's the archive software yeah, packages that are doing file archive. Yeah. doesn't support LTFS. So how do I use it? I have petabytes of data that I have to write. So we have an action item. We've got to go get some software guys. If you want to have LTFS support, the benefit of LTFS and the promise of LTFS is not to store data in proprietary format. It's the ability to be able to move data without the need of the application that you used to write to it. So if you want to use backup application, archive application, HSM, you name it, they're going to have to change something, which is if they move a file from an existing tier of storage, they're going to have to move the file in its native form into LTFS so that the end user can use the portability of the tape medium and use the LTFS format to just drag and drop the file without you need to go to the application again. Yeah. That, is the, that is the panacea of what LTFS is, pro yeah. is promising. I, I agree with you because the point is that there should be a standard below the software so that they will write in the same format. That means LTFS, then it's possible for other softwares or the users to be able to get it directly from tape. Right. So, so, so that, is, that is exactly what LTFS is intended to be. Yeah. Right. But his point, to be his that point is that, that the software doesn't support it. Mm -hmm. So and but, I, think that, I, think it, I think it's a great action item. I think that my belief is if we can get one software company to support it, backup software company, the rest will fall very quickly. But I also think it's important to note that SNEA has a technical work group that was just started to standardize how LTFS is utilized. Um, and once there is, because IBM owned the LTFS code, and they donated it to SNEA to make it so that they can make an open standard that everyone can write to. And I think that's a good first step, because even the APIs weren't real well defined before. So I think there's progress also in how backup software companies could utilize it. Question in the back. Uh, question, has LTFS evolved so that you can create, have, create a file system that is capable of spanning tapes? Not without a application to do it for you. The LTFS file system by itself is not, but there are applications that support LTFS that can span tapes. Because for me, sort of the holy grail of, of what LTFS could be in, in a data center would be, you know, I've got a, a big tape library with you know, a thousand slots, and I can have a, a single global file system that maps across all of those tapes. And those products do exist now, yeah. Um, and they are designed to take the technology of the single mount point of LTFS file systems, create it where you can span across a big tape system and have it be one big you know, petabyte LTFS system. But it does take some extra software beyond what's in the drive firmware. Can you name one of those products? Yeah, um, Crossroads, one of the guy who's vocal in the audience. Um, okay. QSTAR is able to. Um, TSM from IBM is able to. Uh, HP also does a product that's, that spans across libraries rather than just handling a, in, a single standalone. In the, form of a, in the form of a single file system yeah. mount point. Yeah. Yes, I think so, yes. I think that, well, the library implementations that I've seen, every tape is a mount point. So, I mean, I don't, I, don't know that, I don't know if that's universally true, but the ones that I've messed okay. with. But I think the message is clear getting a little bit vendor agnostic. I think there are great solutions also to support LTFS and to support the LTFS in an active archive, actually. Yeah, if you right. go to the activearchive.com website, a lot of those products but support it. With, with software to help make it scalable to that size, yeah. In, in, a, in a university account that, you know, I was involved in, which is 500 terabytes, IBM was also involved. And it worked fine for 45, 50 terabytes type of size, even with the virtual library. Beyond that, we saw so many performance problems, reliability issues, and the file How system got frozen. How long ago was that? This is recently. You in know, the last six, 12, six months or so? Yes. I'm hmm. talking about even last month. 
We mm -hmm. saw the problems. You know, I don't you know where that would products. be coming from. I this is can't yeah, say. so. So yeah, when that's we, not because the LTFS. Yeah, we switched to TSM and basically worked fine. It yeah, could. I don't know. I mean, that's not the LTFS. Each individual mount point is being presented if you're doing a large system through right. some other software. That may be running into a problem. Uh, David, how, how big are your systems? Involved. You guys are. Populating. This is a technology that's only been out a year, and it takes a while to write a petabyte. But you know, you're talking five billion files, and that's 30 petabytes ish. It can scale to. We're in projects right now that are over 100 petabytes that they're working on. May I ask a question? You use <coughs> TSM to write to LTFS. It's TSM or HSM? TSM. TSM, you said. Okay. I think the key thing around the LTFS. It, it is still a fairly new technology, and it's continued to sort of like develop. Um, as sort of Molly's indicated, the, it will become an industry sort of standard. It will be adopted, and it will be, again, once it becomes adopted, that's where you'll see more implementation in some of the different applications, and it will become a real sort of standard. And I think that the fact that it's a fairly early technology is what you're coming across. That's why I asked how old the firmware and drivers were, that there's constant evolution, especially with it now being worked on within an open work group, that the drivers have changed. Um, and I'm not from IBM. I can't speak specifically to it. But I know that they've been working on that. So, yeah. Right. Were you writing directly to the LTFS tapes through TSM? No. Okay. Okay, and then TSM, you're just writing the native LTO at that point. Okay, that makes sense. One, one question, please. Uh, which operating system supports LTFS? Which operating system supports LTFS? LTFS, as I, as I say, will become an industry standard, but it's available through sort of Mac, Mac, Windows, and Linux. So you can basically write does a tape. My, does Microsoft support LTFS? Yes. Yeah. So you can with, write which, a, with which uh, operating system? From Windows so is seven upwards for, in most cases. I think it supports everything. Yeah, yeah and, and literally you plug the the tape drive in and it shows up as a, it, you know, the, the, the original goal really was to make it almost as easy as a USB thumb drive, a really, really big USB thumb drive, but yeah. Yeah, a thumb drive nonetheless. So, any questions? Boy, we really nailed the LTFS subject. I was kind of surprised by that. Another question right here. I did, but apparently he was still wants to talk about LTFS. So. Does LTFS also support worm drives? Worm? No, no, it For doesn't. Worm? LTFS doesn't support worm technology. It, you can't write to a worm tape with LTFS. Worm tape? Really? One of the things I would say, the, the way that LTFS actually writes data, it always appends data. So if you basically drag a file off the tape, and you modify that file and then push it back onto tape. It simply appends it. You still have the option through the LTS, LTFS software to roll back to the previous version. So in a lot of cases, LTFS has a lot of compliance because you can't actually go and say change the file. Um, so, as I say, because it always appends sort of data. So, in, in some cases, it is warm, but for that reason, it doesn't support warm media. Do you have a specific worm need, or, or was it just a kind of a general question? archiving. Okay. Just thinking of long-term archiving, right. many industries have to keep data available for at least 10 uh, years in the industry sure. field in Germany or 30 years for medical or as many as uh, 50 years for certain other applications. Okay. Don't some of the uh, active archive guys have the ability to 
uh, stored in their own format and then export to LTFS too. So you could get there that you could do worm and then when you needed to get a transportable media, you could flip to LTFS. Yeah. That seems like you're you're sh chagrining. I'm not sure about that. Okay. We plan to support this kind of functionality. You can't Linux. delete off Worm, but you can make a second copy, I guess, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because you're still reading. Write Worm is yeah. write once, read, read many. Read as many as you want. Right. You so it would be just it. another read. There's some software that you can use which basically has the ability to write data in a Worm format digitally, so it can be written to disk, something like a software um, file lock by Grow Data. They can write data into a Worm format, and then it can be moved off to tape. So for that reason, uh, that would... That would allow customers to get around to some of their compliance. Who's got the next question? Go ahead. That's a good question. Amazon Glacier, do you guys think it's a tape in the cloud because it's a five hour retrieval time? Okay, so I'll give you my personal, that's just my personal opinion. It's a guess, of course. Okay, my friend. I will. <laughs> I believe yes. Yes, what? That yes. it's a tape in the cloud? Tape that they are, they are more and more tape in the cloud application out. I think LTFS enables actually, you know, the tape in the cloud in an active archive. So why shouldn't Amazon take advantage of this? But I would be very careful, by the way, with Amazon Glacier because there are so many hidden costs. And then look at the SLA from an Amazon. Good luck with that. So do you guys see Glacier as a threat to the tape industry? No. Do you want to know? Think, than no. Number one, I think Amazon, <laughs> what? Is, a, em, no, Amazon is a cons, Amazon is a consumer, not an enterprise solution, number one. And just look at the total cost. It looks attractive, but if you add up the total cost, yeah, it's, a it's half getting a expensive. Just try to retrieve data. 100,000 bucks for a half a petabyte exactly. per year. So and, five and, and years, half exactly. a million bucks. And the time. It's expensive. And the time. So I think it's, you see, the only thing I'm worried about is that you go to your boss and uh, your boss knows about Amazon and he has, has no clue about, you know, you might know about all the extra, the hidden cost, but he sees this huge cost advantage and asks you how to do it. He wants sales per game. You know? But at I the end of the day, it's expensive and there is no, if you try to get an SLA out of Amazon, good luck. How many, anybody in the, uh, everybody know about Glacier here? Well, tape guys, come on. You did, so a few. Um, I, so I would recommend, there's a great article from one of your good friends, Henry Newman. Okay. Well, I don't know if I'd call article. him a good friend, but, no, but, but that's a different discussion. No, but Henry, but had a, Henry Newman published a, some good articles on Glacier. You might want to read that. Well, you are most of the vendors. You guys must know who's, who's the Amazon buying customer. Oh, there you I think go. Honestly, they might not be allowed to say. <laughs> They might I, not. Number one, you know, I would, what I would recommend, there are, as I said, great solutions out where you will or can use tape in a cloud similar to what Amazon is offering for a fraction of the cost we are storing today. So look at that, you know, active archive solution with tape, tape in the cloud. I think there are great solutions out to optimize, you know, with your budget. Your data so do you think that we'll see um, enterprise competitors you know, that, that are a provider that's going to provide a Glacier-like service, enterprise class at a, you know, hit all the I right wouldn't price say, points? I wouldn't say Glacier. I would say a better. Okay. A better solution. Okay. You know, I can't uh, promote what we are having and what we are promoting, but I would recommend go on the website, Active Archive. Altio 6 is still out of the Altio 6 might have some promise. <laughs> okay. There you go. No, I think I'm, I'm surprised because... I'm surprised that nobody's asking about L206 and uh, why the capacity point is so low. I think usually com people complain about the low capacity point of an L206. Hey, I have a question. Why is the capacity point so low on L206? <laughs> Just saying. The, the capacity point on L206 is pitched at the point where you can uh, get uh, media from multiple vendors. We believe that a fundamental value proposition of LTO is the ability to get multiple drive vendors and multiple media vendors. So and a certain cost point that, that drives to point, yeah. the cost per gigabyte of LTO being yeah. where it needs to be for consumers to be happy yeah. with it. Yeah. So what is the capacity no, I, going to be on LTO 6? 2.5 native 6 um, compressed. Typically. But nobody, you know, the question now is how many really can compress. But just one point, I agree with him with your statement in general, you know, that it's set to the point where everybody can produce and manufacture a tape because 
it's an open format. But I just want to make one point here, which is very important. You know, tape has a future, and it's not stuck with 2.5. You know, I think there are companies out, especially one company out, no, I can put this out, who has proven, you know, many demonstrations, and we have products out which already have uh, four, respectively, five terabyte on the tape based on a special uh, bearing ferret uh, formulation. And um, we have demonstrated with one of the big hardware manufacturers already up to 35 terabyte on a tape in 2010. So it's just a question of time when, this, uh, when the next when the product comes out. So there is a, a good future, a great future for tape, especially considering that uh, the disc vendors have major problems these days, you know, coming up with higher capacity. I think they just came out with four terabyte, the disc vendors. And tape already is out with five, respectively, four terabyte on, on tape. And uh, I think there's a great roadmap out and a great technology supporting the, the future of tape. I'd like to go back to your comment you said about having multiple vendors. I sat here at s about five years ago and watched a presentation on the LTO roadmap right before LTO 4 came out. And they showed that famous incremental curve that implies doubling of performance and this is something that has been known by the manufacturers for years. And it's a message that you communicated to the consumer that all the way through this LTO8, there is this kind of concept of where capacity and performance were going. So it's no secret. It's not something that's been delayed. And you have consumers that are trying to plan, particularly as we look at where tape goes in the world of archive, is we don't just buy for next year and the year after. We're thinking 10 and 15 years out. How do you respond to someone who's trying to look at how do I evaluate, evaluate tape in an archive implementation when the manufacturers don't even keep to the concept of what is a suggested roadmap? It wasn't that anyone specifically said, here's the number, but it was definitely implied. And now your comment is, hey, well, the manufacturers had to have multiple vendors. That's something where I would have thought they should have been planning. I guess we didn't plan that to happen this time around, but it was we thought very, very important that we retain the, the ability to have multiple vendors this time. So, so, so was the but, problem, but, but just but to make sure I, I got I, that, um, so is the problem that to get, if, we, if you would have just doubled capacity, only one vendor would have been able to supply tape? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah but, you know, I think the, the sad part here is that you as an end user suffer from that, more or less, because when the LTO consortium in, was it in 98? brought out the LTO road, the first LTO roadmap was very obvious, you know, that they more or less doubled the capacity every two years. So it was just a question of pure, simple math to calculate, you know, where we are in 2012 with capacity points. Um, and they actually announced the roadmap at 3.2 terabyte, they had to reduce it. I think every media manufacturer was or should be able to, you know, come up with some development and research and development and some, you know, spend some money and do the research come up with a solution, and more or less they promised, if, you're, if you recall, I think they all promised that we, they have a technology to support 3.2, and finally they couldn't. So I think it's a question of what you promise and what you can deliver, but there is, and that is what I think it's very important, is there is a great future for TAPE, and I think there is at least one company out who has a roadmap for TAPE, who has a technology to support the future of TAPE. It's okay to say who that company is. I know it's killing you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I got to be neutral. No, um, okay. I, I take I take the chance and promote Fujifilm here. You know? I think go. Fujifilm has a great bearing ferret technology. I think bearing ferret clearly. You know, you have to consider one thing when you talk about technology. Uh, we are talking about uh, density, and um, mm -hmm. so there is the bit size. It's extremely important, and how many bits per square inch you get on a tape, and how many uh, what the packing is on on tape. Uh, in order to get uh, to the capacity point. The current MP has the limitation because the smaller you make the particle, the more you lose uh, magnetic signal strength. So you have to find a particle which gets smaller in the, in the size but doesn't lose the uh, magnetic signal strength. And bearing ferret is the signal uh, Fujifilm found, you know, and is working with. And we can reduce, I think, actually our current particles are half the size of an MP, still maintain the, magnetic, uh, the signal strength. And I think we are increasing our density from currently 1.5 billion bits per square inch to currently 6.7 billion. And we demonstrated already 29 billion square inch on the per square inch billions, which shows, you know, that there is a, a roadmap out. And I think this, in fact, you know, I think you keep your uh, signal strengths and you keep actually uh, archival 
life. Okay. So, so the reduction was made from three terabytes to two and a half terabytes? Yes, it was. Yeah. So does that kill you guys, not having the extra 500 gigs on tape? Is that a real deal breaker for you? Anybody? No. Okay. Problem solved. Yeah. That's what I do. Um, who's got the next question? My man in the back there. I'll let you run over there while we're waiting. Oh, wait, wait. By the way, he hasn't announced himself. That's Greg Duplessis. Industry veteran and yeah. thank you. Uh, you were talking about density. Uh, it's very interest, interesting that uh, okay. What uh, now that the density are increasing, how are you going to guarantee the uncorrectable bit errors? To guarantee that we don't have more, you know, you know the quality of uh, data on the tapes. So Go for it. Reduce the bit. Whoever okay. wants it. Okay, so, yeah, sorry. So that basically is, is the whole purpose of, of tape drive research, is to make sure that as you push the bit density or the track density or the, how thin the media is, that you can still recover the data with um, the acceptable error rates. So you, each new generation built in new techniques into the, the drive itself to improve the way that the head um, detects the data, improve the way that the head tracks on the data, uh, and also techniques that are built into the data channels to uh, recover data from um, lower raw signal-to-noise ratios. Uh, because ultimately what you're trying to get to is a, uh, an, un an, uncorrupt an uncorrectable error rate uh, for the user, uh, which uh, meets the specification. And yes, you do have to make sure that you, int you introduce new techniques each time to, to retain that uh, fundamental data reliability. And, and clearly tape, the, at least the numbers I've seen, has a much more breathing room, if you will, on, on density than, say, hard drive technology as an example. Yeah, fundamentally, it's got a, I think it's two orders of magnitude more um, uncorrectable error rate performance than a, than a hard disk drive. And you, you need that if you're storing huge amounts of data. You, you have to have that kind of confidence. And I think it's fair to say there's a couple fairly famous studies outside the research labs, and there's millions and millions and millions of dollars that go in the research labs, you know, in HP and IBM for the tape drives. But um, CERN has published a pretty interesting study, so has Lawrence Berkeley Labs on their own data sets as they've gone and validated this as well. Um, and those are, those are interesting data studies from the scientific community that are out there as well. And they're on the Active Archive website again. Yeah. So it's a great website to go on and look and, and take a look. I think there are great articles on great uh, solutions for you, you know, and case studies. Okay. Got a question in the back? Uh, yeah. Whoa. Um, just with regards to the media uh, that we were talking about a minute ago with Barry and Forrest and MP, just to be quite clear, is there any difference in reliability for LTO6 between metal particle that's been used in the past and, and Barry and Ferrite, the new media type? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I can speak for Hewlett Packard and say that uh, you, we have to put a, a tremendous amount of effort dur in, uh, during the, the development phase to make sure that the data reliability is exactly as the customer expects it. And uh, uh, I'm quite confident that there is no difference for LTO6 at the capacity point that we have uh, between uh, MP media and uh, Varian Ferret media. So y you basically you pay your money and you, uh, you take your choice. It, it, it meets the specifications. We wouldn't the, release it otherwise. I think the bottom line is tapes, the last line of defense. We can't sort of take any risks with customers' data. Quite. The tape vendors really, it's, our whole reputation is built on basically being that last line of defense. So, when your T duplication yeah. cable gets corrupted, that's where you're going, right? I just want you know one answer to this question, but I think it's liability is what more or less what the what the vendor is you know giving you as a liability. I think I'm pretty sure that the I2 consortium tries to you know make sure that both perform well. Uh, there are studies out, and not just done by by Fujifilm, but there are clear studies out that Bering Ferret has a n no a degradation after 30 years. So I think it keeps the magnetic, uh, the magnetic signal strength over 30 years without any degradation. Uh, so I think there is not necessarily a performance in running the tape, but it's uh, an archival performance. Is that 30 years sitting idle on a shelf? Or is that in a drive? That's sitting in an archive, in, in a probably cold archive. Okay, good conditions. Hmm. Okay, good. Next question. Yeah. Got it. 
Chair, just to follow up on that, though, because the 30-year thing is, is true for Bain and Friar, but presumably it's also true for the previous five generations of LTO tape, which are also, that also have 30-year archival guarantees. Absolutely, yes. Great. Uh, did you have a question? Or are you just kind of waving? Next question. Anybody? So the um, so what differentiates the different vendors? You guys are all uh, let's let's talk about let's kind of roll up the sleeves a little bit. Molly, we'll start with you. Why are you better than the guys to your left? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's SpectraLogic really where we differentiate and why a customer typically will choose our systems is a few things. We have um, the best storage density in the industry for our tape libraries. We, have, we use three dimensions in our libraries to store tapes instead of two. So we physically store tapes a bit different. Um, we've put um, over 90%, I think it's 92% of our engineers are software guys now. So. We landed on a hardware model about in 2003 for how we make the robots and the sheet metal, and now everything we do is in software. So we have very smart tape libraries that recover from errors, do data integrity verification, verify media health. So it's usually our software intelligence that differentiates us um, after the density of the library. Let's I just go right down the line. Okay, and I guess in the case of Hewlett Packard, it's, um, it's kind of scale, really. It's the... Um Obviously, the fact that uh, you can rely on Hewlett Packard to be here and in, in many years' time, if you're dealing with archive, that's very important. Uh, and also, um, you know, we cover all of the bases. We cover the automation, we cover the drives, we cover the media. So it's, it's that kind of broad church, really. And we try to be agnostic about technologies. Okay. Gabriel? So Quantum is the third member of the of your consortium. Um, but we also do automations. One of our differentiators. We're market leader today in terms of market share when it comes to open system automation. Um, since the beginning, like I think as far as six years ago already, we're talking about intelligence for libraries, about high layers. Um, we innovated the industry uh, with what we call capacity on demand. So we help customers to increase the capacity based on what they need to use. We innovated the industry by providing a layer, basic intelligence around the library providing rational diagnostic around errors. You will never find on the Quantum Library uh, an error code. You will find a text that tells you what happened. The drive has failed or something's going with the media. Um, so that's how we differentiate it, through the value, added value from a software perspective. But we don't stop there. We also go, um, beginning we start talking about disk and tape and some debate about there. We don't try to shoehorn one or the other one. We try to find the right balance between what the customer needs, because tape won't answer all the, all the problems, nor disk will. It's the right mix of both. About 75% of the customer out there use tape. Not only tape, but use tape. And what we provide is a good mix of medium to deliver the solution to customer pain points. That's how we differentiate. Okay. Tanberg Tate has been developing and manufacturing tape products for over 30 years. Our key city differentiator from the other city tape vendors is we are primar primarily focused around small and medium businesses. One, we own the RDX technology, which is really an entry-level tape replacement technology for the likes of DAT, um, AIT, and that's ideal for sort of small and micro businesses. And then we start from our LTO sort of tape drives into our tape automation products um, up to around 500 terabytes. And our key focus is around data protection for small and medium businesses. All our support is in-house, and that's how we really um, differentiate ourselves, is that we are really targeted towards the small and medium business requirements. Okay, I think we don't differentiate necessarily ourselves from these guys, because we're working with all of these guys very closely, and I think it's very important that the media manufacturer works closely with the hardware manufacturer. I think that's key, and Fuji is one of the companies who is f fully committed to the tape business. Uh, Fujifilm is heavily investing in tape technology. Fujifilm has proven capability and, and technology to support the future. Uh, the tape roadmap working with all the hardware manufacturers here. But from our business, we are certainly differentiating besides just selling tape. I think we have a great service offering in our portfolio to support and have a solution for our customers, especially for archive. Especially in Europe, I think we have a special solution. Wolfgang, hands up if you have a question for... 
uh, the European solution for archive solution. Uh, you can talk to my colleague here where hands up Wolfgang. Um, in Europe, what they have to offer, I think, Fuji tries to get closer to the end user and have and provide solutions to the end user, not just selling a tape, which unfortunately became more and more a commodity. Okay. Questions? Yes. Right here. I have a question pertaining to the LTO group. Uh, do I understand that uh, members who, who supply hardware have uh, permit the usage of different media? Suppose you have an LTO from LTO 4 drive from Hewlett Packard from HP, you could also load in IBM drives, IBM tapes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the fundamental principle. Of Is that guaranteed? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely the case that a, a uh, but drive... But it's not true. Well, it, a, a, a tape that is written in, in an HP drive can be read in an IBM one. And well, versa. I can talk about my own personal experience. We have quantum tape, uh, quantum autoloaders. We have HP autoloaders. And we had bought, a, bought many consignments of IBM tapes. And the moment you load an IBM tape on an HP uh, library, the entire library jams. We had to get the technician down. He unloaded it and then he told us that we should never make use of any sort of other vendor tapes. We have to make use of HP tapes for HP libraries. I find that it's that here you have not held to the spirit of your LTO group. I completely agree. That's not what the spirit of the LTO group is supposed to be supporting. So uh, I can't speak for one person in the field who said that, but that is definitely not um, our view. Uh, and but he's fired. With, we'll LTO four group, with, with the LTO4 uh, MSL uh, 40, 4096, uh, if you look at those tapes, um, we have bought two of them from uh, your company, and they work only with HP tapes. You, if you make use of another... Uh, tape like IBM or I think Sony, they jam. They work only with HP tapes. I can talk to some customer we have had where they started deploying H uh, IBM drive, then at some point they wanted to go to HP drive. We support both in our tape libraries. Well, I'm not, con I'm not criticizing Quantum. No, no, we, I'm have, we have good uh, results with your, drive, with your uh, library. They support all the, all the tapes. They also support HP tapes. So, so there. there you go. So um, are we out of time? We should almost answer that. Uh, so, I mean, what's, what's the answer there? Is, is, there, is that a one-off thing? I mean, I, my understanding of the standard is as his, that you should be able to put mixed media from different vendors into. Absolutely. Could it be that he had a drive that was, you know, the track was aligned wrong? Or, or, but you were putting fresh tape in it and having the same problem, right? Yeah, I mean, sorry, I can't cover that. Yeah. I'll let you guys I mean, sweat this one out. Let, let me maybe jump in there, as I said, because I've worked very much in a say, technical role over a number of different years. The, as I said, the LTO consortium is formed to provide customers with the best value for tape solutions, that they can buy multiple different drives and media from multiple sources. And they, everything should be fully interchangeable. From time to time, you will come across certain manufacturing issues, maybe exactly. where a cartridge drifts to one, war, one edge of a spectrum and then maybe within a magazine within the tape library, it's, um, the slot has become slightly tighter. But there are no, as I say, the consortium tests each drive and all the different media types for those to be sort of approved for manufacture and release. So, so my, my point would really be that this is a one-off, and, and in most sort of cases, that problem would sort of, um, really require some sort of technical intervention. Okay. So I, I would contact your local HP. There's an independent um, body which does the testing for the consortium. Yeah, but I think the qualification, I think I fully support what you're saying. I think the idea, and he said it before, why was LTO 6 set on 2.5 instead of 3.2 to have an, to, to maintain, that, exactly. to maintain yeah. an open yeah. format. And exactly. the whole idea of LTO is yeah. to 
have interchangeability among the tribes and the media. Yeah. So that is key. What, what I'm personally missing to some extent is, yes, I think the question from the audience, there is a, a qualification, is it a, you know, the MSC qualification certification for the LTO, mm. um, it's one thing, but then certainly the drive manufacturer to their own qualification on Absolutely. a different, higher level. But I think and that's even the where thing, the tip baby manufacturer yes. and like Quanon, we also do regression the testing. The MAC like qualification so. is not necessarily up to the standard. Mm -hmm. The tip manufacturer qualifies certain meters on the one side. But I think that's where it's lacking, especially you know the margins on the tape is getting smaller and smaller. And I think that's one of the critical issues, especially now with LTO5. And I'm pretty sure that we see marginal issues on LTO6 too. So I think it's getting really critical that, you know, there is a interchangeability among the price and it's tested. But Mo Molly, you guys really don't have a dog in the, in the hunt. Do you guys te test multiple different uh, media vendors in, in your guys' libraries? Yeah, absolutely. So Spectra doesn't make drives or media. So we use our partner's stuff in our libraries. And we do. Every generation we take media from every media vendor and we take drives from every drive vendor. And I think there's an interesting point here, and I mean – given that I'm talking about some of the, my partners here up on the panel, uh, that I do believe that the LTO folks have heard pretty loud and clear that we need to do lots of interchange testing on LTO 6, and I know that they're doing that. So re regardless of what your issue is, may have been on LTO 4, um, I know that the tape industry sees it as absolutely critical that there's an enormous amount of interchange testing done in LTO 6, and that is being done. Uh, and I could, I could step in a little more here. Is that... I'd I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm concerned about your particular application. I think if I, I heard you said you had a quantum library where you put IBM drives in it, IBM tapes, and it didn't work properly, and then somebody from Hewlett Packard told you you should only use Hewlett Packard media. Well, I can. No, no, no. That's not the way. That's okay. not the case. The case is very simple. We have HP libraries, yes, and we put in IBM tapes, hmm. and the Hewlett Packard system went on a freeze. It stopped completely working and then we had to get a technician to remove the new IBM tapes loaded. The technician informed us that HP libraries will work only with HP tapes. Well, he, he and was wrong. Yeah. He, he really wasn't. That, that is yeah. really not our intention. We, well, as, as this is the fact what we have as, as, as and when we put in uh, tapes coming from other vendors onto HP uh, libraries, they don't work. So I think that's something they need to look at offline because yeah, that, that uh, should not be the case. I would. Yeah. It's hard to do a fade and edit. I understand yeah. that uh, there is some so, something yeah. in the software or firmware no. which no. prevents Definitely not. the handling of other media. No. Definitely so, not. No. So all customers should, important, should important be allowed to buy their media wherever they want as long as they are yeah. certified with the yeah. Yeah. consortium. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so let's take that offline. I think that that's a, I'm thinking it's one-off case and a, a, a local in-country person probably saying stuff they shouldn't. So, Greg, I'm yes. Diana. Thank you all. Well, and, uh, wait, hold sorry. on. Don't so leave yet. Just a quick uh, couple quick announcements, and we'll, we'll thank these guys. Uh, these same discussions can happen right after this. Uh, all of our tape vendors here and all of the storage vendors that were here previously will be in the, uh, the show floor theater. At, at, and you can have a casual conversation with them. You can uh, post you know, individual questions that are not in front of the entire group. So they're there. You can go grab a drink in the uh, reception area and go to the show floor theater to have a conversation with them. So just keep that in mind if you want to continue. Uh, I'd like to thank George Crump for being our moderator. Thank you very much, George. And I'd like to thank uh, all of our tape panelists for, uh, for taking time out of their afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe cocktails are being served. Ooh. It's time.